Hi everyone, welcome back to English 200. Today we're going to talk about Ursula Le Guin's short story, She Unnames Them. And I hope you found it very intriguing. It's not as easy as you might expect of just a one page story. There are a lot of layers to it. There's a lot of philosophical richness to it and really a kind of philosophy of language put forward here. So I would suspect that you had to read it at least twice, maybe three times to finally wrap your head around what was going on. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Genesis, you know, have read the Bible, probably immediately picked up on the biblical references. And I'm going to say more about that when I share the slides in a moment. But we really kind of get an interesting play on, you know, the story of Adam and Eve and the creation of plants and animals that God allows Adam to name. And then a kind of well, a feminist response to that, right? You have Eve stepping into the scene and instead of wanting to take power from Adam, instead of wanting to join him in this, this mode of naming and controlling things, she wants to unname things. And that's the, the real crux of it. You know, what does it mean for Eve to want to unname things? Of course, we don't know at first that we're dealing with Eve. We don't really get that until the third column when we finally realize that she's talking to Adam. But I want us to move through it kind of, you know, paragraph by paragraph. I'm gonna share some slides with you. Uh, let me find these here. Okay, so before we begin talking about the story itself, I wanna introduce a concept to you, a literary term, um, in order for us to be able to wield that in this discussion. The term is intertextuality intertextuality. You see the word text in there, you see the word inter, inter meaning kind of between things, things coming together. Intertextuality is when a text in one work is referenced in another. So that text could be a work of literature, film, song, maybe it's a religious or mythical reference, important moment in history, but it's, when, it's that moment when the text directly brings in aspects of that other text into its world, into its story. This allows you as the reader, when you recognize the reference, the intertextual reference, to make a kind of connection, to do a sort of shorthand. So here, you know, she unnames them can be very short because she's expecting that once her readers figure out what she's dealing with, once her readers make the connection that she's talking about Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, then they will bring all of the information they need to really understand the story. Now there are different kinds of intertextual references. Obligatory intertextuality means that the writer deliberately invokes a comparison or association between two texts. So in this case, you know, there's a direct evocation of the book of Genesis. There are, other, there are also other moments of intertextuality here that I'm gonna say more about in a minute. Another type is optional. In this case, the author might invoke it, but it's not essential to comprehending the text. So there are several moments of what we would call optional intertextuality here, um, references that she makes to other works that if you know the reference, it's going to enrich your appreciation of the story and what she's doing here. But if you don't know it, you're not going to miss the meaning entirely. And then you can even have accidental intertextuality. So this means that the writer didn't necessarily intend it. Perhaps it's something that is so seeped in our culture that they accidentally reproduced it. And it's the reader who has made that connection. So it's, it's really on the part of the reader that is bringing together different texts from um, different, perhaps different time periods, different cultures, different authors. So I'm just going to move past this pretty quickly, but I would like you to take a look at the slide more carefully. I posted it on Blackboard. You will often hear the phrase illusion, not illusion with an I, illusion with an A. And that is a kind of intertextual figure. Something can be alluded to or kind of gestured to, referenced. And that usually happens in a way that is more subtle than a direct intertextual reference. So for example, we have a direct reference to Babel and the Tower of Babel, the very beginning of this story. Um, that would be a reference probably rather than you know, an illusion as such. I would, I would consider these kinds of degrees of emphaticness. But there are other figures, for example, um, a, well, a word in other language could be used, pastiche, parody, direct quotation, etc. 
Okay, so the main intertext of Shia Names Them, as I mentioned, is the book of Genesis. And this is the creation story. This is when God creates the world and then creates Adam. And then he grants Adam the power to name all the plants and animals. So in a way, by giving Adam the power to name plants and animals, Adam becomes sort of the, the king of his own world, right? At least on this plane, he becomes um, the one who is in charge because the one who names and labels the other has a power over the other. Then God creates Eve from Adam's rib, and importantly, Adam names her as well. So I've reproduced here uh, the New International Version of this part of the book of Genesis. Take a look at this more carefully in the, in the slides, but here I just wanna emphasize, um, the, well, 220. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmate for him. And then further down, God takes from man the rib, right, and makes woman. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So not only does Adam name everything around him, the plants and the animals, but he also names Eve woman because she is taken out of man, right? So this is kind of um, thinking of woman as kind of derivative of man. And this is, you know, this is a, a kind of standard interpretation of this part of the book of Genesis. Well, Eve pretty quickly dispenses with this power. She undoes it, right? And she, the beginning of the story is actually kind of humorous. She goes through all these animals and asks them, you know, Basically, do you like your, your given name? I'm gonna take it from you. And which animals cared and which didn't. Um, she makes some very interesting references to T.S. Eliot's poem about cats, which I'll say more about momentarily. You know, the kind of theories of how, um, how, how cats understand their own names or perhaps birds or dogs, et cetera. And, you know, kind of going through in a playful way, which animals were reluctant to give up their names until they really appreciated what she was doing with it. Other animals that were like, yeah, sure, I never used to this anyway. We don't care, this is just a, a human thing. And then she makes this important pivot. And this is in the second part of the story. So where there's that paragraph break in the middle of the, the page. None were left to unname. And yet how close I felt to them when I saw one of them swim or fly or trot or crawl across my way or over my skin or stalk me in the night or go along beside me for a while in the day. They seemed far closer than when their names had stood between myself and them like a clear barrier. So close that my fear of them and their fear of me became one same fear and the attraction that many of us felt desire to smell one another's smells feel or rub or caress one another's scales or skin or feathers or fur taste one another's blood or, or flesh keep one another warm that attraction was now all one with the fear and the hunter could not be told from the hunter nor the eater from the food so by unnaming the animals Eve has created a situation of radical equality. She feels closer to them because she thinks of herself now kind of on the same plane with them. One cannot tell the hunter from the hunted. Importantly, unnaming doesn't create a utopia, right? There are still those who hunt and those that are hunted. But by unnaming them, there is a sense in which the value that we accord to predator versus prey that disappears. Hunting takes place and it no longer is labeled as having any particular value as such. It just is. Eve and the various animals just are. None are better than each other, right? Fear and attraction become one. Nothing is standing between her and them because language is a way that we make sense of the world, but it's also the way that we delimit it, right? We box things in when we give them a name. We say, okay, that creature there is a cat, or that creature there is a dog. And when I say dog, I'll use dog because I have a dog, not a cat. I have all these things that I associate with dogginess, what I think a dog ought to do. 
if my dog woke up one morning and decided to start meowing like a cat, I would be very disturbed because, you know, he's a dog and I have all these understandings of what dogs do. So, okay, sure, my dog isn't going to stand up and meow like a cat. But let's think about it more philosophically, more abstractly. You know, what is at stake when we name things on a cultural level? So moving away from this kind of literal part of naming animals and taking away their names, how do we think about unnaming at the level of things like categories, labels, identities, male or female, for example, black or white, or any other racial identity, queer, straight, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, young, old, sick, healthy. I've given you these, these binaries down here in this slide. When we give these kinds of fixed names and labels to things, in some ways that becomes powerful, right? We can own that identity and connect with others through it. But in other ways, it could become limiting. If I am told, you know, you are female, then everything that society tells me a woman must do, I have to measure up to that in some way. Or, or not, but then feel as though I have not, right? There isn't the freedom to just be in this state of radical equality that here in Ursula Le Guin's story, you know, with her kind of feminist intervention in the book of Genesis, she's really trying to get us to think about the freedom of giving up these labels that were kind of established in a relationship of dominance. Of course, the story really shifts at the end because she realizes that she has to do the same for herself as well. So she says, and I'm going to close this slide for a moment. Um, I'm stop the screen share. She says at, towards the end in the third column, I had been prepared to defend my decision. This is after she told Adam that she was leaving and he doesn't really seem to care because he's kind of busy doing other things. He doesn't really seem to listen to her. We have a, a kind of a, almost a humorous representation of the husband who doesn't listen to his wife and the wife who maybe nags the husband, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of um, thrown into this really contemporary, almost humorous light here at the end. She said, I had been pre prepared to defend my decision. And I thought that perhaps when he did notice, he might be upset and want to talk. I put some things away and fiddled around a little, but he continued to do what he was doing and to take no notice of anything else. At last I said, well, goodbye, dear. I hope the garden key turns up. Okay, here's a subtle allusion to the Garden of Eden. So we have an image of them being, you know, living um, after the expulsion from the Garden of Eden here, which is very interesting. Then she says, I'm going now. This is in the last paragraph of the story. I'm going now with the, I hesitated finally and said, with them, you know, and went out. In fact, I had only just then realized how hard it would have been to explain myself. I could not chatter away as I used to do, taking it all for granted. She can't say that she's going now with the animals that have been unnamed because she is unnaming herself, right? Earlier in that column, she says, you know, kind of obliquely, but referring to giving back her own name, um, that she could not make an exception for myself. I put away my anxiety, went to Adam and said, you and your father lent this, gave it to me actually, it's been useful, but it doesn't exactly seem to fit very well lately. Again, referring to not just the name Eve, but the name woman. So in giving that name back to Adam and saying, I, I don't wanna have that name, I don't wanna fit into that category. Then she says she's going to go now with them, with the others, with, with those that she's unnamed. But she doesn't even then have the language to describe what it is she's doing, right? It gets kind of um, hard. One can't even really convey to Adam the extent of her frustration and alienation from her name, but also from her desire of her desire to move beyond it. But then the crux of it happens here at this, this very last sentence. She says, my words now must be as slow as new as single, as tentative as the steps I took going down the path away from the house. 
between the dark branched tall dancers, motionless against the winter shining. Oh, what's she referring to there? Dark branched tall dancers, motionless against the winter shining. Trees, winter trees, right? Against the sun. But she can't say tree, she can't say sun. She's given up this language, this you know, normative accepted language. She's given up these categories. Instead, she has to find words, adjectives, verbs that describe what the trees look like, what it is they are doing. Not just what they are, tree, but dancers, dark branched. So the turned descriptive language is a call asking us to really see people, animals, creatures, things, see our world as it is, not just as we kind of habitually accept it to be, because we you know, have to move through the world using language, using labels, using categories, using stereotypes that really limit our ability to see each other. Okay, I wanna share a slide again and say a few more things. Um, about how this story works, kind of going back to the question of intertextuality. So the following slides are explanations of several other intertextual references in the story. And I'm going to post this slide on Blackboard so you can take a look at it carefully, but I want you to try to find where in the text these, these things are mentioned. And moreover, why do you think that Ursula Le Guin choose to, chooses to make all of these intertextual references? And if you don't know what they mean, or if you didn't know what they meant before you looked them up, Googled them, et cetera, what's, you know, what's the point? Do you need to know them to understand the story? Does it enrich your understanding of the story to know what she's referring to? So how does intertextuality work in this story to really emphasize her point? And is it necessary for you as a reader? So here are some examples that I would like you to look for. I already mentioned the Tower of Babel, Babel's reference in the very you know, first part of the story. Tower of Babel, here's a painting of it um, by Brugo the Elder. I've given you Book of Genesis, a description of the Tower of Babel, but take a look at that, okay? Take a look at this Book of Genesis discussion of Babel, its relationship to language and how languages became diverse and see how that philosophy of language is reproduced or not reproduced in this short story. You're also going to find this reference to Gulliver's Travels, um, uh, in particular a reference to the word Hunahims. And Hunahims are um, a particular creature that is found on the island in the goal of her travels. And Hunahims are meant to, um, they're basically their horses, but he calls them Hunahims because he thinks that's what a horse sounds like when it neighs. So we have this moment of kind of automatopoeia, you know, where the, the horses are named according to the sound that they make. So again, this attention to trying to describe things rather than just use kind of a shorthand category or, or superficial stereotype to understand them. So take a look at where you can find that particular reference. Here's the poem, The Naming of Cats by T.S. Eliot. Read through it all. Um, look up on the slide, pull it up on Blackboard, and read through this poem. It's meant to be kind of a children's poem. This is the basis for cats. Uh, maybe if some of you saw the movie. It was a Broadway play. But this is kind of part of the book that that, that play and that movie come from. So we have kind of a, a silly poem about the naming of cats. And cats have their secret names versus their given names, etc. Why does Ursula Gwynn throw that in here? Or why does she just kind of mention it? and move on. How does knowing this poem enrich your understanding of not only that moment in the text, but also the story altogether? She mentions the platonic mouse, actually is the word she uses, so you might want to find that phrase. She uses the word platonic, and by platonic she doesn't mean, um, you know, sometimes we use the phrase like, oh it's platonic relationship, meaning it's not romantic, we're just friends. She doesn't mean it in that, that kind of idiomatic sense. She means it in the philosophical sense of having to do with Plato and Plato's ideal forms. So um, I've given you this, this image here of kind of illustrating the ideal form. The example here is dog. So according to Plato, you know, in everyday world, we have these kind of this physical world of particular forms like 
again, to use example of dog, you can have all these different kinds of dogs. You can have big dogs, little dogs, you know, basset hounds, Great Danes. I mean, in some ways it becomes ridiculous to think of them all as dogs, but we understand them to be dogs, even though they are very different and particular. But when we say the word dog, what emerges in our mind actually is an ideal form of dog. A creature with four legs and floppy ears maybe, or you know, kind of this typical, this illustration of kind of a typical dog. And that ideal dog, that platonic form, might look very different from the dog that you have. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not connected to that. It's connected to this idea that Plato has that there is a sort of ideal form for everything, sort of floating around <laughs> in the universe. Uh, and the particulars of the world are actually just shadows or approximate kind of reflections of those ideal forms. So, you know, how is this connected to the story? What do you think Le Guin is getting at by throwing that reference in for us? How might we think about language in relation to ideal forms? I don't think one needs to be a specialist in Plato's philosophy in order to kind of start to piece together how this might be part of the, the meaning of the story. And the last one I want to give you is the Linnaean classification system. She references this in the second column, the top of the second column. Linnaean classification system is the scientific classification system that was developed that breaks things down. And here, again, we're using animals. Um, well, here's the dog. You know, we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So this is broken down, you know, kind of narrowing it down further and further, moving from basically all animals to down to mammals and carnivores and then canines. And um, finally, we get a very specific species there at the bottom of wolf. This effort to to create this classification system is really an enlightenment, um, you know, scientific enlightenment project to kind of bring order to the world, to bring order to a scientific understanding of the world. And um, it's, it's you know, incredibly useful and still obviously used today. But I do think it's helpful for us to perhaps um, think of Ursula Le Guin's story as sort of a, a critique of this as well, a critique of classification, not in a literal scientific way, but a critique of classification insofar as when we move through the world and classify others in certain ways, we miss out on a more authentic way of relating or in a more authentic way of knowing the world. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I'm really going to be interested to hear your thoughts about this um, and, you know, kind of whether you think the use of something like the Bible um, is appropriate, you know, she's rewriting a pretty important, pretty foundational theological text. Is it dismissive of the Bible? Is it building on it? Is it using your understanding of the book of Genesis in a productive and interesting way? Do you find it sacrilegious perhaps? Um, and moreover, whether you think there's something to what she's getting at here. You know, do you ever feel boxed in by not your, necessarily your given name, but I guess, you know, that could be an issue. Maybe you don't like being named Robert and you want to be William. I don't know, you know, but, th but that's not really what she's saying. She's, she's more interested in names as kind of larger categories of things. So are there aspects of your identity that you have been raised in, you know, whether that's gender identity, racial identity, or even other cultural identities, like Kentuckian, for example, does that fit? What do people mean when they say that? Are there other identities that you wish that you could kind of give up in order to just be in the world? Could we ever get to a world where that was a possibility? Or is this all just pure utopia? I look forward to seeing your thoughts on the discussion board.